Okay, lovely. Well, good evening, everybody. And on behalf of the ACPRC, a very warm welcome to the second pulmonary rehab webinar series. Tonight, we are going to discuss the Pulmonary Rehab Services Accreditation Scheme, and we've got three wonderful um, healthcare professionals who are going to talk us through the scheme and uh, talk about their experiences of working as part of PRSAS. So my name is Claire Nolan. I'm an academic physiotherapist and co-chair of the British Thoracic Society's Pulmonary Rehab and Research Team. And my co-chair who's representing the ACPRC is Dr. Adam Lewis, and he's from Brunel University, and he's also the research champion of the ACPRC. <laughs> um, our speakers include Maria Buxton from the Central London Community Healthcare Trust, and she's also the PR SAS quality lead. So her insight is going to be invaluable, especially for services starting on their accreditation journey. Laura Graham from Homerton University Hospital. Sorry, if um, people could just put themselves on mute. I think there's a little bit of feedback. Thank you. So Laura Graham uh, from Harmerton University Hospital is a PR SAS assessor, and she's going to be talking about her experiences to date as a <clears throat> role. And Jill Doe from the University of Leicester is also a PR SAS uh, clinical assessor, and she's going to be discussing her experiences to date as an assessor, specifically from the practical side of things. So we are having a pretty informal webinar. Maria is going to present some slides, uh, but there will be a lot of discussion and opportunities for question and answers. So if you'd like to ask a question, just pop it in the chat or um, when Adam introduces the questions part of the uh, webinar, please just unmute yourselves and speak. Um, the session, the um, pre presentations by Jill and Laura are going to be just a, a discussion, speaker-led um, presentation. So again, there'll be lots of opportunity to ask them questions about their experiences or really any questions you have about the accreditation scheme. So PRSAS, I don't think needs any introduction, but it is a really, really important part of helping to assure the quality of the services that we lead. And when I was working at Harefield Hospital in their pulmonary rehab service as a physiotherapy lead, I was project manager for the for our accreditation journey, and um, which is why I was particularly interested in co-chairing this session. And although it's a, a a big undertaking, I feel that the endeavour is well worthwhile. And so I'm going to introduce Maria Buxton now, who's going to chat about why uh, accreditation is still relevant and vitally important in the COVID times. And that then after that, she'll talk about the accreditation process. So over to you, Maria. Great. Thanks, Claire. Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's really great to be here talking about accreditation. So thank you um, very much to the BTS and the ACPRC to, to host all of this. Um, the presentation I'm giving, I'm not going to try and lecture you. I think we're all involved in pulmonary rehab. Just as a bit of a background, I do. I am a service lead um, and I used to be heavily involved in practically doing the pulmonary rehab, but not so much these days. But, you know, just to say I'm a physio service lead just like everybody in pulmonary rehab so <clears throat> I am talking from a from a practical experience point of view as well and, and share some of the challenges we've all been through this last um, year really. Um, Adam um, very kindly is going to be my um, clicker honour so Adam can we have the next slide please. Okay so I think what um, what would be really good is if we can have lots of time to kind of talk about these key questions really. Um, I'm going to frame it in a bit of a sort of um, the next few slides but I'm doing that as I say not to lecture everyone but to just try and crystallize the points I think that hopefully will then help the questions. So you know is accreditation still relevant and possible in Covid because Obviously, COVID has thrown a complete spanner in the works and we've all had to change rapidly. Um, and so how does that affect the accreditation process? Um, and is it important? Um, then we can go into actually the, the nuts and bolts of how do you get into um, the accreditation process? And I'm trying to give you some top tips here of how to work smarter, not harder, because it is 
you know, it is an issue about trying to sort of like get all the work done and, and what to what evidence to supply. Um, and then obviously, as, you, as you've heard, we've got two um, assessors who are going to feedback about their experiences so far. So that'd be quite um, good. Um, so the first thing, and I think probably most. Yes, Adam, carry on. <laughs> that would be great. Next slide. Can we, flip, uh, uh, can we flick again? There we go. Um, so this is probably something that um, most people listening to this would be able to recite um, constantly, but I think it's just there again to frame, to frame the whole point of accreditation. So <clears throat> we know that um, the, the evidence base behind pulmonary rehabilitation is um, a great breadth and depth of evidence. Um, I know a lot of it is in COPD, but it's not exclusive to that. And it therefore points to um, what a quality pulmonary rehab um, service should be because it's following the evidence and which has significant improvements, as we know, quality of life, symptom scores, exercise tolerance, um, and a lot of the cost effectiveness side that comes through the exacerbation reduction. So reducing exacerbations and therefore potentially hospital admissions and readmissions, bed days, which really then comes into that quality. So reduced healthcare costs overall is a significant issue. Um, well, not an issue, but it's actually a benefit of pulmonary rehab. And therefore that bumps it really very highly on what services um, are high priority to deliver high value care for chronic long-term conditions because the outcomes are very good versus the cost. Um, and we have to keep that in mind about how pulmonary rehab has got to the position that it has, and we need to maintain that. The other thing for patients, which I think the um, accreditation program brings to them, is it doesn't matter where you are, if we can actually assure that the quality pulmonary rehab service that is your local provider is accredited, you will obviously get high quality pulmonary rehab, and it shouldn't matter where you live, you should be able to get the same thing, north, south, east, or west. Next slide. Um, so what's the benefit for your service? Um, obviously, you know, you know that it's all about patient care. So therefore you can assure yourself and everyone in, in your trust that you are providing fantastic patient care and good outcomes. Um, I think it's also very good for services to actually do a, a sort of like a major in-depth review of themselves. Um, it can be quite challenging. Um, this is accreditation is like a major QI process. And you've got the quality standards to benchmark against and you can look really in depth at your service and look at maybe things need to be improved. Maybe you need to do some more surveys. Maybe you could improve your documentation. It's all positive is actually what this um, um, accreditation proce process is. Um, it also helps you to highlight your practice um, within your organisation. If you're going for accreditation and obviously we want to achieve accreditation, high profile within your trust. Not many services get accredited by the Royal College of Physicians. So really, you know, that's something to be really proud of and to be promoted. And also within your own networks, you know, we're all trying to get um, regional networks going of PR providers. So um, accreditation, you can have accreditation buddies, you can actually help yourself through it, you can actually maybe motivate other services to join. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's a leadership role that you're trying to take on too, which I think is a really good workforce development um, opportunity for a lot of um, physios and, and other um, healthcare providers who um, are working in your PR service. I do think um, the senior organisational involvement is really key because I think, you know, the, the, the pulmonary rehab lead, say a typical band seven um, physio trying to make this happen under their own motivation and steam is going to have a real challenge. And the pulmonary rehab accreditation programme really um, encourages and requires organisational involvement. So again, I think what I'd quite like to see is it's not necessarily the band seven trying to get this sorted out. I'd really quite like your, um, you know, executive board and your quality leads coming to you saying, I think we need to go for this accreditation. I think we need to therefore support you to achieve it. And I think that would break, break down a lot of barriers that um, I think services probably struggle with to actually get going and to try and get the time and, and the resources required to actually do the work. 
Um, the other thing around this is obviously encouraging commissioning um, and commissioning qu quality services is essential. On, and I'll talk about that on my next slide for your local population. So, again, you know, you've got the right service for the right population and the right needs. And as I've talked about workforce satisfaction and confidence before. So next slide. There's that little animated thing, so sorry. Um, so if I didn't go on the national picture, and I think, again, this is something, um, this, is, this is why we need accreditation, I think, because essentially the long-term plan um, talks about long-term con conditions in respiratory and you know, pulmonary rehab is an absolute key theme of how they're going to deliver this. So, but it's only based on the quality of the evidence um, that has proven that um, if we do pulmonary rehab to a high quality standard, we will deliver those outcomes that I talked about at the beginning of the talk. Therefore, if you're not delivering the quality pulmonary rehab as per the standards, then your outcomes will be in question. A classic example of that would be the age old issue around do you do repeat walk tests for your um, walking exercise um, testing. Now that's also in the NACAP um, data, but if you don't do the quality test, um, you can't claim the benefit because therefore your test is in question. Um, so something like that um, is just a classic example of why we should be delivering quality rehab because the outcomes need to be accurate and we need to deliver the promise of what pulmonary rehab can be capable of because that is what the long-term plan is also based on and expecting. So I think if we're delivering quality pulmonary rehab, that increases commissioning confidence. Um, and, you know, again, we're gonna have reduced variation across um, clinical services provision for each service. We're gonna get patients having great care across the country um, and the patient experience will be positive. You know, the satisfaction will be high um, and, you know, we'll get better commissioning. So next slide, please. Um, this is a document, I'm sure most people have seen this, but I think it's quite um, really <clears throat> key for a couple of points that I've picked out. So this was an NHI, um, an NHSE sort of service guidance for commissioning. Um, and I couldn't find the exact date on it, but I think it also came out at the same time as the, as the NHS plan. So back pre-COVID times. Um, but there's, um, there's this expectation from the NHSE, and we had our, our local East of England Pulmonary Rehab Network meeting last week, and certainly our NHSE representative there was, was saying exactly the same thing, that um, the NHS is expecting services to be fu either fully accredited or underway in their accreditation journey. Now, and about 70% of those services are hoping, well, this was maybe pre-COVID times, but certainly to be accredited by 22, 23. 70% of all PR services, um, which is actually quite a demanding task um, and a challenge, but I think the right one to have. One point I've put there in the sort of red dotted lines um, is essentially looking at innovation and the slightly different challenges we've probably had to all cope with last year and this year. Um, so that's all around um, increasing capacity, alternative models. And, and I think we could all talk about the alternative models that we've done, maybe considered, but it should be noted, these are not currently recommended in the quality standards and the provider should refer to the current evidence base to guide provision. Um, and it talks about digital innovation. So just saying it's not um, all the innovations that we've had to undergo recently aren't reflected in the quality standards. Thought next slide. Yeah, next. Great. Um, just to acknowledge, I think, what we've all been through and are still going through, really. Um, Pulmonary Rehab has taken a huge knock with COVID. Um, major challenges. This is just saying what you've all had to be living through. Um, clearly in March 2020, we shut down pretty much nearly all outpatient services, including pulmonary rehab. Staff were quite commonly redeployed 
to other areas, acute care or just other services themselves. And then since then, we've had that sort of up and down, haven't we? COVID surges, you know, have we resumed services to then shut them down again? Um, and clearly the COF referral incentive at the end of 2019-20 um, um, had a major impact, I think, on the most services. Not only, it's like a perfect storm, wasn't it? We had major increase in referrals towards the end of the year and then went straight into COVID shutdown. So, for example, I'll say my, my service has got probably about 800 patients waiting um, currently for pulmonary rehab. Um, and we face exactly the same challenges as everybody else. So um, how we approach the waiting list management, we've all had to be innovative around that and obviously have to rapidly redesign pulmonary rehab, including virtual delivery models, whilst we were trying to get through last year and, and this year. So next slide. So to go back again um, to the same sort of principles, um, accreditation is based on the BTS quality standards. The quality standards are based on the guidelines and the guidelines is based on the evidence. This I know is all pre-COVID. Um, unfortunately, there are no shortcuts to this. Um, I know just because we had to all accommodate at speed, but we can't necessarily change that just because we've had to sort of deliver something different. That's what the accreditation process is. Um, innovation always comes before the evidence base, um, but we have to have the evidence base to change any of that process. Now, you know, even looking on Twitter, we've had the BTS winter meeting, the ATS is going on, you know, you can see it all happening about people presenting their abstracts, their papers. Um, and so the virtual pulmonary rehab um, and exercise testing models um, for home based exercise testing is all coming out and it's still being published. So it's all very fresh and new, but it's not necessarily as robust enough to have changed it at the moment in time. Um, so actually the research is required clearly, and then that will be part of the BTS responsibility to have a look at that and then you know, look at whether the guidelines and the standards need to change. Move on. Um, so I said currently virtual PR is not part of the quality standards um, in that respect. Face-to-face um, -face, um, pre-assessments and post-assessments are required therefore for all models. So you can still do um, virtual pulmonary rehab, but actually the, you know, the bookend pre and post assessments Sorry. need to be done face to face. That's Sorry. because it's a walking test and therefore that's what's in the quality standards. Um, if that needs to change, then obviously the evidence and the guidance needs to change and therefore the accreditation program will change with it because it's reflecting on the quality standards. Um, to actually gain accreditation, there's a lot that needs to be done innovatively um, online, um, but to actually achieve the final accreditation status, there needs to be a site visit where the assessors go on site and actually see classes, see the assessments, speak to the staff. Um, and so therefore, if that we have to do a site visit, then we need to therefore see something happening. So the face-to-face -face classes and the assessments um, will need to be provided as part of that final accreditation visit. So um, the next bit is just, I've said this before, until the body of evidence changes, we're still led by the current quality standards. Um, and obviously walking tests, as we know, are all part of the exercise prescription, um, which is why we need to see them in, in, in happening. Um, and this is just a statement in, my, in clarifying, clarifying my head, really. PR is, is widely accepted and funded because it has been shown to deliver the outcomes that are valuable to patients and reduces healthcare costs. A different type of COVID necessary virtual PR, which we've all been doing, needs to prove itself to achieve the equivalent outcomes. Next. So this is just my posing a, um, you know, a, a question out there and, and be interested in your thinking, really. What if virtual rehab models don't deliver the outcomes that face-to-face -face rehab does, but we change the quality and guideline standards so that we can achieve the accreditation? My concern is, are we in jeopardy of selling out what is proven um, and we know delivers the, the desired outcomes that the NHS plan is relying on? And I think we just need to be careful what we wish for. I think innovation is great. We really need to look at it and we really need to modernise with it. And this is not trying to hold that back, but we just need to be careful that we don't jeopardise what we know has been proven and therefore has given formally rehab the status that it has today. 
Um, next. So here's my natural pause in that whole thing. Um, so um, over to Adam, if there's anything that we need to discuss from that part of the presentation. Thank you very much, Maria. That was uh, a brilliant overview, and I'm sure that there are lots and lots of questions from the audience. What I'm going to try to do is stop sharing the screen now um, and go back into your presentation later so I can see everyone who wants to unmute and, and say something. So uh, bear with. Okay, so uh, all the cameras off. Perfect. Um, so if you do have any questions for Maria, um, please just unmute um, and ask away. Adam, while we're just waiting for people to ask questions, I've got one. Um, firstly, Maria, I just want to say I always admire your straight talking. <laughs> And I think uh, you got the message across loud and clear. Um, so really, thanks very much. My question relates to the role of the BTS quality standards versus PR SAS. And so if a service is achieving the BTS quality standards, so they're delivering a good quality care because they're adherent to national standards, what is the benefit of applying for accreditation? Why is that important? I think, um, good question, Claire, and I think probably a lot of people will want to know, is it worth the pain, <laughs> I suppose, is what um, it, it may be perceived as. Um, there's one, I think, it's in, I think it's really good that the NHS England, if you like, body is, is asking for services to be accredited. One, because it's, I think it is, a, it is a kite mark. I know we've got the NACAP audits. I do think there's a slight issue with the NACAP audit in as much that you can still enter your data into that, but still not necessarily hit all the quality standards. So, you know, it's, again, the classic example of if you don't do repeat walk tests, but, you're, but your data shows that you've got an increased walking distance at the end of it, I'm sorry, but that's not a quality pulmonary rehab outcome. And you could therefore claim that that really shouldn't even be claimed as that. <laughs> so I think really um, some of all of this to me is getting that badge of, of absolute assurity that you've got a quality pulmonary rehab program and nobody is in dispute what that means. Um, I do think it will hopefully do lots of things for your service, as I said, benefit for you within the trust, some organisations, some infrastructure, because um, I think sometimes you might be running a great pulmonary rehab program, but maybe it's not at the scale you want. Maybe you can't do innovation. Maybe you can't put research into it. Maybe you really are doing it, but at the detriment to some of your staff feeling quite stressed at trying to perform that way. So certainly I think there's benefits for the trust to be engaged with these services a lot more than they probably are right now. People talk about CQC. I mean, I do think that would be something, again, if you're having an external body review your service, well, your organisation, and you've had a chance to have services go to accreditation, but they've declined it, I'd like to think that CQC would be very interested in saying, well, why would you do that? Because clearly this would be a great avenue for you to showcase your talents and your services, and you've chosen not to pursue that route so that would be of interest to me so I think really I do think it's still worth going for even if you are doing a great deal a great job um we just need to really get that it's like a kite mark isn't it of of, of fabulousness and Marie there's a bit of background noise coming from your end is there is <laughs> That would be my husband cooking the sausages. <laughs> <laughs> At least the alarm didn't go off. He's shouting. So <laughs> phones in, but clearly it's still not picking it up. Moved out of the room now, so I'm hoping. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. I've I've got um, a question actually uh, about you say you need to go to people higher up than the immediate clinical teams to get influence in accreditation, um, sort of managers, and I'm I'm just thinking. To what extent you've had success with commissioners uh, taking on board the value of pulmonary rehabilitation full stop, let alone the accreditation scheme for pulmonary rehab? Um, I think probably, I mean, there's lots of people on this call. So I think a lot of the, 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 um, the pulmonary rehab network leads will probably be able to answer this question even better than I can at the minute. Um, Certainly from the accreditation point of view, I think the engagement with commissioners is not as direct. Clearly, we're dealing with the services ourselves. So I think actually 
um, you know, I, I can only speak for sort of experience, um, my own experience in that respect. I've, I'm lucky I've got um, a very proactive group of commissioners who I work with, and that is reflected in the sort of size and breadth of my service. But I also came from an area where I had totally disengaged commissioners and it was reflected in the small size and the narrow breadth of the service that was ran there. Um, I'd like to think that the fact that this guidance has come out, um, like I said, that guidance document from the NHSE is pretty broadly saying you need to have a pulmonary rehab service that's good quality and you need it accredited, which therefore means it needs to jump through hoops, if you like, to actually achieve that accreditation. And I'm hoping that will have some momentum um, with the NHSE expecting that delivery of 70% to be accredited. You can't be accredited without going through that journey. So if that's where the leverage comes from with the commissioning, then bring it on, because I think that's what we absolutely need. But I think from the individual service, like you say, the clinical leads, I think, yes, you need the clinical leads to buy in because they're going to be doing the, the bulk of the work. But I think you can't do it without that top-down organisational support. Um, and certainly, I think if the way that the accreditation is also structured and the evidence you need to provide and maybe the comments and the oversight, you can't do it unless you actually do have quite senior input, I think, into a lot of the evidence that needs providing for risk assessments, you know, the sort of the more corporate sort of oversight of not just the clinical, am I doing good pulmonary rehab classes? It's how is that service incorporated into the body of the organisation and the wider quality input around a QI process. You know, the PDSA cycle just needs to keep turning so that you can actually review and improve, review and improve, and and what processes your organisation gives you to enable that to be achieved. And I think that's higher than just the, 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 the band sevens and whatever, just working really hard to try and do this. Brilliant. Thank you, Maria. Um, time for uh, another question before we go back to your presentation then, I guess. Does anyone else have a question for Maria at this point? And if not, uh, Claire's highlighted the chat uh, function as well. So if you do have anything that you want to just type into the chat whilst Maria continues talking, that's also fine. So anyone with any questions? At I the can moment? just keep talking. I do talk a lot. <laughs> Hi, yes, I have a question. My name is Catherine. I'm one of the um, Band 7 physios um, running pump or involved in pulmonary rehab in Belfast. I guess at the minute, from a very practical level, we're running such a blended kind of service with virtual um, DVDs, um, some face-to-face -face assessments, some virtual assessments. Are there aspects of the accreditation that we should be focusing at now when it is such a blended version versus when we get back to face-to-face do you know, I'm just wondering where should we start when everything's still very much up in the air? Yeah, fantastic question, Catherine. I think everyone's wanting to know the answer for that one. Um, I think you're not alone. I think most services are running blended programmes in some form or another. Um, I think as far as the accreditation process, um, it depends, I suppose, where you're on in that journey. Um, clearly, face-to-face, -face, you know, let's say, let's take the... Um, um, the SOP to start with, um, your, your operational plan. Um, if you, you need to kind of like really get that robust in a face-to-face -face descripting descriptive way, because obviously even if you're then putting in, like you say, virtual models, live programs via Zoom or exercise modules um, or apps or whatever, that can also be part of that SOP. That's all innovation. That's evidence about thinking, about sort of um, how you've gone about getting patient engagement and how you're modernizing and, and feeding back and changing your PR service. But the basic principles of what that PR service needs to provide um, your pre, your post assessments, your exercise prescribing, your sort of monitoring, your um, your development of the exercise, your educational components, that's all part of your key SOP. So I think to me, it's like get that basic face to face descriptor right and add and bolt on um, the extra bits that then describe your blended model. Thank Does you, Maria. Um, we do have another uh, few questions in the chat, but what I want to do is allow you to finish your presentation first. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll, I'll crack um, on. This bit's I'll, not as long as the other bit. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and share my screen again. One second. Um, go back to Confucius. Right, here we go. Go back to Confucius, yeah. Uh, is that 
uh, showing now for you, Maria? Yep. Okay. Okay. Blah. So here we go. Um, so where are we at to at the minute? We've got 74 um, services registered for accreditation. And I think I'm just trying to think overall. I think there's over 200. Don't quote me. But I think um, there's a huge amount that obviously haven't signed up for this yet. Um, and that's not a criticism. That's just factual. I as you can see, there's clusters. So certainly um, Kent, Surrey and Sussex have done a great job of joining as a network. Um, so has the North East. Um, and obviously other services have joined. And I think we're um, I'm, I'm looking again at the Manchester um, side of things as well. So I think. We've got a really good cluster network approach, but we've also got individual services joining as well. 74 in total. Um, clearly, we've got a long way to go to get everybody um, coming on. But I really want this accreditation journey, not to be too X factory about it all, but I think this really is a journey. It takes a long time um, because you're having to do the day job as well. Um, and I want the accreditation process to be supportive and that's what we're all here for so hopefully we really can see more services joining in um i've said it's supportive and it really is meant to be supportive it's not meant to be sort of like a great judgment where you get this sort of like final you know um outcome at the end of it and everyone's sitting judging whether you're good enough or not this is meant to be trying to help services get accreditation um, and support them, even if it's highlighting maybe to their organisational leads that you need to support this service a bit more, actually, um, which may be sometimes a bit challenging for the clinical lead to do, but it's not challenging for me to do, <laughs> because that will be part of the job to say, we need to support this to actually achieve this accreditation process, you might need to put some more um, infrastructure together, some more IT equipment, some more um, staff. Um, so, the whole thing is, as I say, is trying to create that sustainable service. Um, and we want to accredit 100% of services. That is the aim. We are not out to, sit to, to, to you know, stop people getting accredited. We want to get them there. Um, so it's very collaborative. And we also work with um, patients, lay assessors. So they bring, obviously, their own unique perspective, which is totally what it's all about, really, which is can they, as patients or, or certainly lay people, um, look at the patient-centered aspects of the service, like what's your website like? What's the access into the, um, the actual venues? You know, is it disabled friendly? Is the parking okay? What do the patients say about it? Are the staff friendly? You know, is it clean? Um, all those really, really important things, you know, all your patient information leaflets and stuff, you know, that's what they bring to it is what does it feel like from their perspective? So that's really valuable input um, that all services could do with. Um, so as um, many of you know, um, the actual accreditation standards, we've got seven domains, um, which are all listed here. Um, and each domain splinters off into many multiple points. Um, and actually each point then therefore is its own self. And you need to write um, comments about your service and then upload evidence to support what you're doing about let's say leadership strategy and, and management. Move on. So um, this is a, a lovely sort of pictorial um, view about how it goes. The, the, the time scale on the bottom, you have about two years probably from enrolment, which we all know has had a bit of a hiatus with COVID and we, we're allowed to have that hiatus. So, um, but we do want to, you know, we're starting to see services now submit. It's still only a handful. Um, Harefield led the way um, and we've got three services currently going through that um, um, review by the accreditors at the moment. So that's, um, you know, that's four services that have actually entered into this sort of review stage and hopefully many, many more are obviously in the process somewhere on this journey. So clearly once you actually um, apply to be um, part of the accreditation, um, you get access to the website and you can review all the resources and we're updating those all the time. Um, and certainly I'm working with Dragoner, who's actually the, the program lead to try and um, look at what's available on there, modernize it, tweak it as people you know, come to us with ideas and, and um, we can change things and resources that you will be able to find useful. So you get your website account, we do, oh, go back. 
that's it um you go back onto your training days and i think i can't say that enough there's lots of access to the pr um sas team we're doing training days there's sort of like you know monthly drop-ins if you like for question and answer sessions so really do use that team to help you um you then need to sort out talking about amongst your own team um bring your team together set up regular meetings this is a long journey um and everything needs to be tasks allocated bringing evidence together um meet again i keep saying about the senior managers they need to be aware and in supporting you in this in this process um to explain the accreditation process and what is required from them then you're going to look at maybe dividing up those standards you know you've got seven domains let's take one each um Let's then work out how we're going to collect the evidence and bring it all together. Um, and then you might start to, to, and that's going to take quite some time. Um, and I think um, looking at, and this is part of the top tips, I'll say this again, because my, my service itself is going through this, um, its own journey to do this. And, you know, they've learned huge amounts just by trying to collect the evidence and maybe how to structure it together, what evidence answers which part of the questions, maybe what needs to be expanded upon. And this is what I was saying before, you know, you think you've got it sorted until you actually try and pull together the evidence to upload and you realise you've got gaps here and there. Um, and maybe that exposes things in the service that could be tightened up and just improved. Um, you then might want to upload those evidence. Um, and again, there's training days all the way through. Um, you can start creating an improvement plan saying, right, we need to change. We haven't got enough minutes. We haven't got um, risk assessments sorted out. We need to then really develop the SOP. Um, and you just keep on going through that complete um, process of improvement upon improvement, that cycle, and just keep going really. Um, once you've actually finished your evidence and then you've uploaded it, you've got your comments sections um, and then you request an assessment from the PRSAS team. Um, and then you'll have your um, evidence um, reviewed and comments will come out from the um, assessor team and go back to the service where the service will then have an opportunity to look at those comments and maybe come up with and answer the comments and maybe produce some more evidence. And then you create your time to actually have your site assessment. Um, and then hopefully we get on to the achieving the accreditation process. Now it says here that's about 18 months. Um, there's about two year window to do all this. Um, and I think um, COVID has just made that stretch a little bit longer, but because we want to, we want to be flexible and support people through this. Next slide. Um, how to work smarter, not harder. And I think having reviewed, um, and again, you know, thank, thankfully, and, and very grateful to the services that have submitted so far, because in a way, you've all been, you know, the front runners and the guinea pigs, really, of how we're actually learning. And we're doing our own quality in, um, improvement program as well, because actually, it's, it's really good to see what people are, are, um, are submitting, and maybe how we could help them more, and maybe give them some more evidence, uh, I'm sorry, more suggestions as to how to make the evidence work a bit harder. So um, what I would say is absolutely look at the um, PRSAS um, guidance around um, the accreditation and what evidence is required for each domain and each particular point in each domain, it tells you, that's your Bible, that absolutely tells you what evidence needs to prove what. Um, what, what can happen is, is you submit everything you've got, which isn't necessarily asking the question. So it goes back to what my mum used to say is don't tell them what you want to tell them, tell them what they need to know. Um, and so you need to submit what's required. And it could be that, um, you know, we're, we're designing a, um, um, another spreadsheet for you all to use, which is you put all the domains down the side and actually does the evidence you've submitted answer that particular question? Yes, no, or partially. Um, if it's no, well, you don't need to upload it for that um, for that particular point. If it's partially, maybe you might need to change it. Maybe you might need to improve the evidence that you're um, producing. Um, blank templates aren't really useful. Um, you want to see completed examples of templates. So if it's about staff development and appraisal, not that I want to see the exact person, but maybe show me how you would actually evidence base the appraisal process and the staff development, rather than showing me a blank, this is what the appraisal blank document looks like. I want to see demonstrate demonstrate um, evidence that this is changing practice, changing how you do things and showing that you've got that QI constant improvement um, hat on. 
Um, use those comment sections to actually really um, describe what's going on and what evidence you are uploading to help explain what is actually happening in that domain and also acknowledge the gaps. It could be, you know, um, you may not be as strong in a certain point and it could be, well, you know, we didn't, we did do team meetings, but we never really put the minutes in properly. So therefore the reason you haven't got anything for two years worth is we only started doing this properly for the last 12 months, something to kind of acknowledge it. Or if you upload something, um, even it's a trust policy document, but it was 2014, <laughs> for example, acknowledge that you've uploaded something that's 2014 and the fact that you've searched to see if there's anything been more recent because it shouldn't be that old if we're going to put it as current evidence and you've raised this at trust level and actually this is, you know, so there's some descriptor around why you've done what you've done. And again, I can't state enough that it's it's the PDSA cycle, if you like, it's the so what. Um for example, if you've done patient um, or staff surveys, um, so you've asked the questions, um, A, what were the questions? B, what was the replies? And also, um, what were the themes? And what did you do about it? Because you could say, I asked all the patients and they said it was great. Um, but that's not really improving anything. It'd be like, well, maybe they said we could have um, wider print on the patient information leaflets. Okay, that's the feedback but then we want to see that you've taken that you've maybe changed your leaflet you've actually redesigned it you've relaunched it here's the new version um, and you can see that cycle of constant improvement going on um, which is really key for a lot of these standards it's the it's the complete cycle okay moving on um, so again <laughs> smarter and harder there's no getting away from it you do need time to do this um, and therefore staff need to be possibly freed up to do this um, as well. And this is where you need that team lead support, corporate support um, to go for accreditation um, and, and think about how you're going to um, smartly look at what topics you're going to do, how you're going to divide up the time between the, between the teams. Um, somebody in our East of England region um, talked about a super sop which I thought was a great idea which I'm going to said I've taken and used to death which I'm starting to already but this super sop is your main document this is where you really need to invest your time um, and, and use your appendices to put your trust documents in your templates so this literally works for you really hard so everything that you really want to explain is in your sop and this sop will be repeatedly submitted as evidence on multiple um, domains. And that's absolutely fine to do that um, because it will be looking at different sections um, to answer each of the domains. So make that document work for you. Create your own evidence spreadsheets. Like I said before, maybe upload what you're gonna submit for each um, domain point and actually then does ask the questions, does it need, um, does it answer that um, domain itself? talked about corporate engagement. And I think really when you've actually come through this, you should have huge pride in, in what you've achieved, great teamwork, because you can't do this on your own, um, and use that motivation to really kind of like push yourself through to get to that point where you submit. The PRS um, SAS study days are all there. And as I said, we really want you to, 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 to achieve accreditation and we'll help you as much as we can. Move on. That's me, done. So I'm not sure if there's any questions for um, Adam or whether Laura and Jill um, want to have a go. Thank you very much, Maria. I'll just have a, a look at the chat um, from earlier. Uh, there were some good points. Um, there's a question from Sarah Hill uh, saying, do you think 70% of services will be accredited by 2022? Um Personally, I think that would be a huge challenge, really, um, because it's a long journey. Even if you started today, I mean, 74 um, services are in that journey already. Um, I'm sure it depends where they are in that, in that whole pre-submission 
cycle and and that's a bit that I don't have that much sight of really if everyone is at the very beginning and it's now two years later because let's face it the last year has been pretty much on hold for everyone and it still may be quite difficult to get back to that and I think the accredited the you know the Royal College and everyone is very very aware of that really and are being very flexible to kind of go let's just start seeing if you can start building towards submitting there um I think it will be a big challenge. I mean, there's a lot of services that haven't even joined up for it yet. Um, so I'm hoping the political need, if you like, to push the accreditation will will help sort of like push the numbers through. Um, but yeah, I think it will be a challenge. Thank you, Maria. Um, I'm I'm wary of the time and and uh, really want to give Laura and uh, Jill uh, time to speak. So if I can hand over um, back to um, you, Claire. Thanks, Adam. Um, so we're just coming up to quarter to nine. So we're a little bit behind schedule. Um, but I think it's important that we fit both Laura and Gillian's perspective in. So I'd like to introduce Laura Graham, and she's going to talk uh, briefly about her role as a lead assessor. Thanks, Laura. I, I will keep it brief, I promise. Um, and I think I've phrased which is always nice. Um, so just to say, see, so yeah, I'm a, a lead assessor and I've also done a, um, a, a doing, I should say, um, an assessment um, as a clinical assessor. So supporting the lead assessor. Um, and I suppose just to highlight the lead assessor role is the one that takes responsibility for the overall assessment. Um, so that's responsibility of initially reviewing all the evidence. Um, and before the clinical and lay assessors review it just to see that it's robust enough and there's enough evidence to support the standards, making a decision about going through um, to the to the full assessment process. Um, the lead assessor's also responsibility, um, main responsibility is liaising with the service. So you spend time um, after the initial assessment review, um, feeding back to the service, obviously giving um, the decision of whether it's tight, whether it we're able to proceed to, to the site visits or to the virtual visits as we may have had to do through COVID. Um, and then and then if not, giving feedback and, and kind of supporting the service um, as, as how as best you can in, in terms of how they can then achieve that accreditation process. And as Maria's highlighted, it is very supportive. We want to make sure that, you know, we want services to become accredited. Um, so it's a very supportive service um, process. And then the services have time to go away um, and decide how long they're going to need then to um, make the changes that you've suggested. Um, I think from my perspective, just quickly of why I wanted to become assessor, an assessor. Um, so I'm also co-chair of the London Pulmonary Rehab Network. Um, and I felt not only with my role within my service as, as one of the service leads um, supporting my service through accreditation, it's really given me insight into what's required. And I think probably I maybe wasn't quite as aware when we signed up to the accreditation process of just how much was required for this um, whole journey. Um, I, I, mean, I think we can all say that we were, if you are signed up, it, it seemed quite overwhelming when we started. But I think it's really given me insight into just what is expected for each standard. Um, and I think, as Maria said, the, the, the services that have submitted have that is now accredited. You know, you really are trail blazers in in this process for us you know you've really set the set the um the mark there and and I think it's really given me an understanding of how to support my service but also London services as well um and you know within London I, I think for me as as one of the chairs um and I chair the network with Dr Sam Khan it's really given me the ability to make um a case for change with commissioners and also at a regional network level so I would really urge you all to to and to make contact if you're not with your regional networks um, it would be great to set up pulmonary rehab networks everywhere um, because I really think together you're much you're much stronger and and I would say within London we've gone from having five services signed up um, to having 17 signed up and that's been since we've had the network um, and so it's really really to bring that supportive um, process to get to clinicians together and, and now we run regular accreditation training as well so that we, we're all in this together and we're trying to support each other through it so I, I don't want to keep going on for a while because I know I want to bring Dillian in and obviously there's questions as well but um, I think 
as an assessor, what I would just say, if, if you're interested, please get in touch with Maria or and the and the um, team because it is it's really useful. It's been really useful to me. Um, it does take time. I think that's something to just say, but it's really really valuable um, if you do get involved. So I'll hand over to Gillian who, who's going to um, give her experience now. Before you do that, could I just interrupt because you brought up a point, Laura, about commissioners yeah. Yeah. and there was a question in the chat from Paul. Let me just yeah. find it that I think would fit really nicely in there. So mm. from Paul Mills, he said CCG and health boards are having constant contacts with non NHS providers who offer them low quality pulmonary rehab, not accredited. How do you fight this? Well, I think it goes back to what Maria said in her presentation is, you know, PR, does it do what we know the evidence um, base shows that PR delivers? And you, you can call something pulmonary rehab, but it, if it doesn't deliver the same outcomes, it's not pulmonary rehab. And therefore it goes back to those, those patient outcomes, but also healthcare costs. And I think that's where we've been quite successful in parts of London at, at you know, building a case to ensure that services have access to venues to deliver face-to-face -face rehab and assessments because that we know that's where the evidence base is and um, so I think it goes back to that really I think you know you can yeah and, and I also think um Paul that the the pressure has to come from the top down yeah. so there is a PR service specification guidance document that was developed specifically with commissioners in mind to guide yeah. them helping make their decisions about what pulmonary rehab services should look like and um, so I think it's a bit of a difficult issue to tackle um, as a, a clinical jobbing physiotherapist and um, so like Laura said connecting with your network connecting with senior management and um, uh, to help them fight your cause will, will hopefully help thanks so much Laura um, and so Jill over to you thank you Claire, and thanks Laura and Marissa um, with the team is to review the evidence that the services have submitted and really to have the opportunity to have a really good look at that with the support of the lead assessor um, and think about really clinically have they demonstrated what they need to to meet the standards but actually are they just missing demonstrating that by not putting the right things in the right places and we talked about being supportive as assessors and being able to put comments back to the services about actually you might have demonstrated this really nicely in this domain but if you just add in this and this you might be able to demonstrate that better here so thinking really practically about what the services are doing and through a clinical assessor role, you're kind of using your experience in pulmonary rehab to be able to do that. So I'm in a research role at the moment, but prior to that, I was team lead for a community service for around eight years. And the reason I took on the assessor role was really, I felt like I was able to bring something to the table in that way from working in a community service. So I think there'll be people on this call tonight who are in that position. We were a really small service. There was myself and one physio assistant, and that really grew um, to a team of 10. We ran between 30 and 40 programmes a year. We started off writing our own standard operating procedure. And, and actually, that's quite daunting when you begin, but it can be done. And I think the PR community are caring and sharing. You don't have to reinvent the wheel there are some fantastic um, SOPs out there. There's some super SOPs, as Maria alluded to, that you can use and you can build on. And I think if you're going to bring things in that you'll trust use already, make sure they're relevant, make sure they're appropriate, make sure they're in date, make sure. Um, so you might have a fantastic service, and I'm sure that all of you do. But if you have a mission statement, can are you tying that into your trust values? And we talked about. Um, Sort of making yourself visible as a team to get that buy-in so have you been to speak at your trust board do you need to raise the profile of your team have you invited your executive team to come out and see rehab and look at what a fantastic service it is and speak to your patients and again I know that's probably a bit trickier at the moment but when we start to resume a little bit of normal business like that's the way to go you need to raise your profile and that is the way to get buy-in from the commissioners I think in our experience um, 
I think there's probably a couple of other things that I wanted to mention about sort of evidence that I reviewed so far. Um, was just not submitting everything that you own that says PR on it. <laughs> it's really tempting to do. Um, but yeah, use the tools, as Maria said, look at does it meet, does it meet that standard? Um, and, and could you meet, could you be more clear? Could you put in your comments that you might have had patient feedback um, and how you demonstrated, you know, you took that to a team meeting and you explained a bit more to your team about where they could do better and then you put an action plan in place. So it's all about completing that cycle, which Maria mentioned. Thank you, Jill. I've, I've got uh, just a brief reflection really on, on the cycle part of it. So this all goes back to the uh, evidence that's in guidelines um, that then gets shifted towards the standards and then the accreditation. Well, you have to ask where the, that evidence from the guidelines comes from. And um, one of the services that was uh, has been accredited is the Harefield service. And if you look at how much research has come out of that service, and if they've got accredited and your service gets accredited from the community, you're saying that you are on a par with a, a programme that has produced the evidence which we base our whole work on. So maybe that will help commissioners. Uh, that's an angle to go down. I don't know. But uh, just reflecting on the cycle of things. Are there any questions that anyone would like to ask uh, either Jill or Laura? And I think, Laura, you've popped in the chat um, about how you can sign up to be a, a, an assessor. So I think all the information is on the website. And just to big up the courses run by the PR SAS group, a couple of my colleagues have attended them and uh, really learned loads. Um, and speaking from personal experience, uh, the support that our team received when we go, were going through the um, accreditation journey, Maria, uh, was... <laughs> Uh, was really second to none and um, Nina who was working there at the time I could pick up the phone to her and ask for help and she was always there so uh, really they are speaking the truth and um, I would just like to uh, while people are either typing questions or, or getting them ready I would just like to point out a, a couple of things so um, pulmonary rehab week is next month and uh, my co-chair of the BTS Teresa Harvey Dunstan is just jotting any uh, just jotting some information in the chat so keep an eye out for that message also uh, we're going to be running running another webinar on that week so any ideas that you have please either pop them in the chat or send them to my email address, which I've popped to the very first message on this chat. If you think of something tomorrow, next week, whatever, please do get in touch. Um, and sorry, a message has come in that's caught my eye. Someone's gate crashing from Canada. Sorry, she hasn't finished the message. My apologies. Would you like to unmute yourself? Oh, you've just said it's a really useful webinar. Excellent. Um, <laughs> so um has anybody got any other questions can i just highlight claire also um that there's a podcast the ats have done a podcast on on the accreditation it's about a 20 minute long thing um uh dr lindsay hushan i think um uh, did it with uh, prof sally singh so that that could be a good uh, other listen following on from uh, this webinar for anyone who's interested in any more over overview. And the link is uh, one of the messages I posted earlier on in the chat. Um, our previous webinar was on restarting face-to-face -face pulmonary rehab and a couple of services who are involved in that webinar have quite kindly agreed to write some case studies on their experience. Uh, which we'll be sharing next month on, a, um, on the Respiratory Futures website hosted by the BTS. So we've got a, another question. How much time needs to be devoted to accreditation on a weekly basis, would you say, starting from scratch? Laura. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I think my tip would be have a regular slot for it because it's very easy to lose sight of it when you're having to juggle lots of things. So um, I think there's a 
personally from our service experience and we are probably still some way off submitting just purely from working an integrated team it's been really challenging to dedicate time uh, to this I think you need to when you're going um, to forward with this and, and signing up is actually get that time agreed um, ahead of time if possible and um, I, th- I think I you know it would be lovely to have half a day <laughs> a week to devote to this I know some services Claire I'm, I'm not sure how much time you guys were working on it towards the end um, or Maria's service but I think we have now in the situation where we're trying to dedicate at least half a day to a day for our service lead to focus on this um, because you need that time you need that protected time. Yeah I'd agree with that mm-hmm. Um so there was another question are there any guidelines for writing SOPs I think that's a wonderful question and Marie I'm going to pass that over to you do you have any SOP examples that you share? Yes. Yeah, so if you look on the, um, the, the, the PRSAS website, you've got um, the one example is actually the Harefield SOP that's actually on there anyway. So you can actually have a look at that. Um, and I think, as you know, certain trusts may actually want you to write in a certain way. So um, you may have to follow a trust sort of format for, for your own SOP. So one look on um, you know, your trust website because they may have a standard stop that you then have to fill in the gaps for because it follows a certain flow. Um, and also we are just about to kind of like um, probably put on the website a, a more SOP, write your own SOP guidance, <laughs> really. There are things on the website to actually look at, um, but certainly there's going to be something fresh coming out around um, what we want included in each SOP. Um, I know the Harefield one, I mean, Claire, you may want to even talk about that yourself, but certainly it was written with the accreditation in mind to actually sort of like really focus in on those key domains. Whereas it may be if you're doing a far more sort of corporate, quite stiff template, um, you know, it has the it has the main um, functions in it, which will be you know, around what's, you know, what's your organisation, what's the staffing structure, what's the hierarchy, um, you know, what is pulmonary rehab, what are you providing, you know, venues, um, explaining the venues, looking at the photographs, you know, the actual, and it goes walking you through, if you like, your pulmonary rehab service. So it's like um, an absolutely detailed guide of what it is that you're providing. Um, but we will be putting in some more um, practical guides to come to help you formulate that SOP. So watch this space. Thanks, Maria. There are just a few more questions that um, it would be great to, to stay and discuss if that's OK. I'm just aware it's a little bit past nine, but we won't stay on too much longer. Um, so a message from Sarah Hill. Um, what do you think were your biggest challenges during the process with getting accredited? Um, the main one was time. And also towards the end, keeping the, the team on board and aware of what was going on. And so when the site visit happened, that everybody felt comfortable and confident and, and able to ask questions. Um, a lot can be changing with uh, when you're trying to prepare for accreditation and keeping everybody informed and on board um, I, I certainly found was the hardest thing. I don't think we did it very well. And it was something that um, Karen Ingram, my colleague, who now leads the rehab service, will, will address. And um, there's a question from Helen Owen. Dare I ask what happens if you don't have the evidence together by the 24 month mark? I'm two years in now and still a long way from being ready to submit. Maria. Um, don't worry. <laughs> I think everybody is pretty much in that boat, Helen. Um, In normal pre-COVID worlds, there's there's an expectation two years could be long enough, but I think there's absolute understanding that that is not going to happen at the minute. Um, So we are flexible. We want you to sort of progress through um, and and totally understand that, you know, if you've had all your staff redeployed, you know, what how can you progress through? So I think it's um, it's very real as far as where you are. I, I wouldn't worry too much about the two-year guidance um, at the moment. So I'd say don't worry and just try and carry on as you as you as you start to bring your services back online. Thanks, Maria. And we'll just finish with one final comment. Um, those working in pulmonary rehab in the UK are really so fortunate to have this accreditation process. There are very few physios in pulmonary rehab in Canada, 
and a really good opportunity to improve one service. That's a really lovely comment, so thank you. Um, and a couple of thank you messages. And there's a message from um, Teresa Harvey Dunstan about pulmonary rehab week. Teresa, do you want to unmute yourself and you can be the final uh, speaker? Yeah. Okay. Um. So, um, so lovely to meet you. Yeah, your uh, line isn't great. Is that better? Yeah. Much. <laughs> um. Yeah. So, um, to hear um lots of inspiring stories again, and lots of sharing and and and, and good experience from. Lots of people with a wealth of knowledge. So, um, just to let you know that Pulmonary Rehab Week, which starts, uh, I think it's a Tuesday, the 22nd of June, um, for seven days. Um, several of the societies, um, I, I co chair with Care for the BCF, um, and we had a discussion with Sally Singh some time ago, and we've pulled together quite a few um, associations, including the ACPRC, NHS England, um, the o National OT Society. Um, well, BLS, there's quite a few all coming together to share resources and actually share a common platform for uh, getting the messages across over that week about some of the things we've been talking about, thinking about QI, thinking about back to face case, new innovation. And there's going to be lots of sharing on Twitter of existing resources, particularly there's, there's lots from the ACPRC and the BLS have got lots, but not only just from the service providers, but also lots of patient testimonials and videos as well. So we're going to be using all of that. So please look out during that week, help us disseminate all of that information, get involved. There will be some other activities and um, we're, we're due to meet again. Um, and we're thinking about getting some real, sort of trying to get some uh, community activities going on as well. Maybe it might be a trying to do so many steps per day or something like that, but we've not quite nailed that down. So do look out for all of that information. It will coincide with the next webinar in four weeks' time, um, which we hadn't necessarily uh, had a conversation about what we wanted that to be on, but there was some possibility about linking on from this to look at QI projects and some examples of good QI going on out there in the community. But um, we can let you know about that once we've um, all spoken um, again together. So thanks for tonight. A any information that you want about this week, then please reach out to um, Claire, myself, any anybody from the ACPRC. So Rachel Colcross at BC Gardner, Adam um, as well. So just reach out to us and we'll get you that information. But we will, we will be putting it through Twitter uh, nonstop. So. That's wonderful, Teresa. Thank you so much. Um, so just a final thanks to our three speakers, Maria, Jill and Laura. I really, really appreciate your time and your insight. And there are so many positive comments on the chat. Um, so it was such a, a worthwhile webinar to do. And uh, it will be great to have you back maybe next year and, and we'll see how we're getting on. Um, I'd also really like to thank my co-chair, Adam. I always enjoy thank you, Claire. any activity with you. Do you want to tell everybody about what you said about PR SAS? <laughs> I, just, I just add sass to everything claire as you know so <laughs> um and also huge thanks to the acprc for hosting this event and we will see you all next month thanks so much and bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.